subscriber friends and welcome to the quiet corner this is a knitting and hand spitting video podcast where i talk about my love for all things fiber from my little corner of the world here in ottawa canada my name is vanessa and other than on this channel you can find me on instagram at sea salt and stone um, you're so welcome here, and as always, I am um, such a grateful host of this podcast, and um, the past few months of entering into this podcasting uh, community have just been such an honor and such a pleasure, and now that some time has passed, it's been really lovely to uh, get to know some of you better, um, whether over on Instagram or uh, by uh, just hearing from you in the comments down below. That's actually one of my favorite parts about this, is hearing from you in the comments. Um, yeah, so as always, just... Uh, really grateful that you've uh, chosen to spend some time here. Uh, so a huge welcome to new and returning viewers. It's been, uh, if I'm being completely honest, uh, it, it's been a heavy week. My head and my heart have been focused on other things. Um, so it feels a bit difficult today to podcast about knitting, um, but I'll talk a bit more about that in, in the chatter segment if you care to join me there at the end of this episode. Um, it's also been a crazy hot week here in Ottawa. Um, it's not uncommon for our summers to be crazy hot. It was 35 degrees with the Humidex. Um, for a few days in a row there. Uh, so, and my husband Dan and I are teleworking from our little apartment and um, it, it gets pretty hot up here. We're on the um, third level of a complex, so all the heat rises and there's not much airflow. We do have air conditioning in our bedroom, but it doesn't, it's not powerful enough to cool the entire house, so. All that to say, I'm really grateful for today because uh, it's down to about 15 degrees this morning. It's nice and cool. Um, it's cool enough for hot tea, which makes me really happy because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't love the heat. Um, I love a cool house where I can snuggle up with you know, PJs and warm socks and a cozy cup of tea. So I already miss winter. Isn't that terrible? Anyway, so here I am. Um, I've got uh, just plain old peppermint tea today. Um, and of course I do have some essential oils diffusing. Um, the past couple of days I've been really into this blend uh, from the Now Essentials Blend brand. Um, and it's their Morning Sunshine Blend. And it's got rosemary, grapefruit, orange, peppermint, and cinnamon bark oil. Um, so it's got this really, it, it's another one of those cheerful blends that I, that I love. And I'm really on a peppermint and citrus kick right now, so the blend of peppermint and citrus is really happy for me. Um, the other one that I have really been enjoying this week uh, is this Woolsey's blend. Um, it's their stress relief blend. 
Uh, and what I actually did, because this blend is already in a carrier oil, so that means it's diluted with um, another oil that's not an essential oil. So, for example, that could be something like um, uh, almond oil. Uh, so anyway, I put it in this roll-on, and I've really been enjoying that. Uh, just to roll a bit on my uh, neck throughout the day while I'm working. Um, and this one has Liang Liang, patchouli, sandalwood, orange, uh, and then carrier oils. It doesn't specify which carrier oils, but um, yeah, so that's been super lovely. So I hope you're all well. Um, I have a really packed podcast for you today because it's been, I think, about five weeks since I've last, since I last podcasted. It's been a big stretch of time just because um, I would have podcasted last weekend, um, but we ended up having some plans on on the Saturday, and Saturday is usually the day that I use to podcast, so uh, this weekend worked out better. All right, so let's jump into FOs. Um, I have a couple of uh, finished objects to show you. The first one I will show you, um, these are the uh, socks that I knit for my brother. They are too big for the sock blocker, but <laughs> just to give you an idea. Um, yeah, so he has a size US 12 foot, um, so it's way too big for this sock blocker, but um, these were knit up in the West Yorkshire Spinners Signature 4-ply in their peacock colorway. Um, because he wanted teal in his socks and um, I managed to find something with a bit of teal. Uh, so I just did my standard uh, vanilla sock recipe, two at a time, toe up, magic loop, um, Turkish cast on, garter stitch heel, which is my new thing, uh, but as always, I turned the heel with uh, German short rows. Um, I did a shorter cuff and uh, about an inch and a half to two inches of two by two ribbing with Jenny's super simple stretchy bind off. Never know if I'm saying that right. Um, so hopefully these fit him. They're the first pair of socks that I've knit for him. Um, and I think this little stitch marker is where I left off on the last episode. I think I was just at the point of, just before turning the heel. Um, so, that's that. And I've got, um, I always like to, when I gift socks, I tuck the ball band uh, inside so that the recipient of the, the socks has the care instructions for the wool. Uh, and I also, um, Put a little sample of the leftover yarn inside in case they ever have to do any mending. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to get these off to my brother. Um, and then I just have a couple more gift knits on my list. Um, for this year and then um, I tend to do like a lot of my 
selfish knitting <laughs> in the summer and the fall and then I start up gift knitting in the winter which is kind of funny because I think most people prepare to do their gift knitting for Christmas but I tend to prepare for birthdays um, my gifts are always late so they never really arrive on anyone's birthday but you know it's the thought that counts right <laughs> Um, okay, my second finished object. I finished Dan's cardigan. I wasn't originally planning to finish it this quickly, but I just decided that I was going to focus mainly like prioritize uh, his cardigan um, because as the weather gets hotter here I just really do not want I didn't want to have this thing on my lap it, it was already way too warm the past couple weeks working on it um, <clears throat> and I'm as I've said before itching to kind of start my summer knitting Project. So I have now it's not washed or blocked, but it's done except for um, it doesn't have the buttons yet. It's not washed and blocked, like I said, um, but it fits him and um, it's all seamed up and the uh, ends are woven in, so I'm considering it a finished object at this point. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Um, yeah, so I'll show you the front and then here's a sleeve with the cable panel panel goes all the way down the sleeve all the way down the front and then there's a larger panel at the back um so reflections on this project I have a few and I guess also just to mention again this is the uh, Mount Auburn cardigan by Irina Anakiva. Um, I knit most of it in the uh, size large, um, mainly because my gauge, my gauge swatch was a bit off. I needed to cast on more stitches for a larger size um, to get what actually is more of a medium sized cardigan uh, for Dan. Um, and I knit it to the measurements of one of his favorite uh, cardigans so that I could try to replicate the kind of fit that he likes. Right now this is fitting in most places actually with a tiny bit of negative ease. Um, but uh, because my swatch uh, grew after washing, um, I'm expecting that this will relax a bit and then it'll fit him just right. Um, if not, it'll still be okay because it still fits. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of my hope. Uh, okay, a few reflections. I think if I were to knit this again, uh, I would have gone with a yarn that was a bit more crisp um not quite as soft as the cascade 220 
Um, I think it still has turned out beautifully. Um, I'm just, uh, I think the, the cables probably would have popped a bit more with um, a more crisp kind of sticky wool. But uh, I still like the kind of soft, softer effect that it's given the cables and the seed stitch. Um, some modifications that I made. The pattern, I believe, is written for double moss stitch. Um, and I'm not as much of a fan of double moss stitch as I am regular moss stitch so I I did the whole thing in just regular moss stitch I did make a mistake uh, with the button band I didn't read the pattern <laughs> I think at that I don't know if at that point I was just like I had zoned out with the pattern uh, but I was supposed to slip stitches um, so that this part where the collar connects to the button band, that there's a more kind of smooth connection there. I'm hoping that it will block out a bit and look less lumpy bumpy, but um, overall I think it's a pretty minor, minor issue. Uh, in terms of cast on and cast off methods. I used, I think it was Jenny's super simple stretchy cast on. It's like the equivalent to her bind off method for um, when I cast cast on for the, the ribbing at the bottom. And also when I cast off for the ribbing on the cuffs um, or sorry cast on for the ribbing on the cuffs I use the same cast on for that as well and I do like it because it's super simple and it uh, it follows it follows the pattern of the ribbing I don't know if you can see it there Uh, but then for the collar and the button band, I did a tubular bind off uh, so that there, once this blocks out, it will have a, a very invisible bind off edge. Uh, so in hindsight, I kind of wish I had a, had done a tubular cast on just to make them all matching but um, from a distance I don't think you would ever really notice. Um, yeah so I think those were my main reflections for this knit. Um, a couple tips I guess in case you are ever interested to knit it or even if you're just interested to take on a bigger project like this um, where you have kind of all over cable work um, one thing that really helped me was to uh, break it down into uh, kind of a set goal for a number of rows that I could reasonably knit every day. Um, you know, just a half hour to an hour of knitting on it. Um, so I found it really helpful just to uh, break down uh, my goals. So I would kind of say, you know, in I want to knit the sleeves in a two week period of time. And then I would figure out how many rows I would need to knit each day 
for those 14 days to finish the sleeps in that amount of time. And I found that to be really motivating because it was a way to break a big project down into smaller, smaller tasks. Um, and I think that's why it helped me to finish it sooner than I expected. I thought that this project would maybe be on my needles for like a year. <laughs> so, um, color coding the, the cable chart was extremely helpful. I took the time early on to color code the entire chart. Um, and it was just so much easier to read it. It was a lot less stressful and I think it prevented me from making mistakes. Um, I managed to get through all of the cable work um, without actually making a mistake in the cable work itself. Like there are mistakes in the sweater, you know. It's definitely not perfect. Um, but I, I managed to not fudge up the cable work and I think that's because I had that color chart and so it was actually pretty hard to lose my place or misread it. Um, sticky notes were also essential to kind of, I would kind of mark where I was on each row and move it up on the chart. I think that helped me to not lose my place on an otherwise quite complicated cable chart. Um, but honestly, once you, once you get going with uh, detailed cable work, you get used to the stitches and they're actually not that complicated. Um, once you learn them and do them, you know, three times, you get it and then you realize it's actually pretty simple. Um, so I hope that no one would be afraid to try something like this for that reason, because I, to be honest, I was a bit apprehensive about knitting this cardigan. It's definitely the most, I would say, complex knit that I've ever tackled. Um, and I think that anyone could do it. The last thing was just making sure you have if you can, um, good tools. And I think I showed you on a previous episode um, the cable needles that I used, the Brittany cable needles. I don't have them with me right now, but they're short wooden cable needles with a divot in the center. Um, and so they, they don't as easily get caught up in your In your knitting or you know slide out and then you drop stitches um, I found them to be really really excellent tools um, especially for this project where I was cabling quite a lot um, I'll just I'll dig those out for you one more time so this is the set and this is what the set looks like Um, they're the best cable needles I've ever used hands down so that's that and um, yeah I'm looking forward to blocking this and um, selecting some buttons for it with Dan and I will try to get a photo um, I'll probably post it on Instagram if he'll let me. And there was one other thing I wanted to mention um, for my FOs. This is a new, a new thing that I've started to do. Um, when I finish a project, I create a little cue card like these that tell me uh, what the fiber is. And I put a, a sample of the fiber 
on the cue card and then I'm just storing it in a bag so that I have um, I have a sample of the yarn that I can always use to do some mending if I need to. Uh, the other thing that I've started is a little scrapbook for each of my projects just to keep track of what I've knit and some notes on the pattern and then a ball band and a little sample of the yarn. Uh, so I've uh, yeah, just started doing that for my garments. Uh, this is the one for the Mount Auburn and this one's from the Autumn Lake pullover. Okay, so those are my FOs. Um, for works in progress, I have two things to show you. Okay, it's gonna be kind of hard to get this in the frame because the just because of the shape. But this is the terribly simple, which is a, a crescent shaped shawl uh, by Caitlin French and it's a free pattern of hers. It's, it is terribly simple. <laughs> um, because it's free, I can chat a bit, a bit about how simple it is. You literally just knit two stitches and on the third stitch you knit front back, then you knit all the way across. On the third last stitch, you knit front back and then you knit two and it creates a crescent shaped shawl which again it's hard to see the crescent because it's all it's all jumbled up on the cord here but um, I knit this with uh, the hand spun that I showed on a showed you on a previous podcast this is what's left of it <laughs> and this was um ashford corydale with a mystery white fiber that i had in my stash uh, and i created rolex uh, from those two fibers um, and what I did with the roll eggs, they weren't really a fade, but uh, I did do several that had a lot of white, about half, half white, half of the olive color. And then I transitioned to uh, the olive green roll eggs and a few of the olive and white roll eggs. That's what it was. Uh, so the white was still fairly muted, uh, but those were plied together uh, toward the end um, of the skein. I don't know if that makes any sense, but essentially I had the beginning of the skein, uh, the roll eggs were, with all of the white in them were overlapping, were being plied together. And then toward the end, uh, the roll eggs had more green and less white. Um, so it didn't create, uh, it doesn't create a fade, it creates more of a, a bit more of a, clear color shift um, and it was just something I thought would be fun to try and so far I really really like it 
I think that some of the hand spun qualities, well, I guess it would be interesting to see what this would look like in stockinette. Um, I think that maybe you would see more definition in the color shift, but the garter does kind of have a nice effect in that um, it, there's just more marling um, going on. Yeah, so this has just been um, a very simple, it was an impromptu cast on because I finished my brother's socks and I was still working on Dan's cardigan, but I needed something that was just like even simpler than socks. Um, something that was just really, really mindless and this has been just the perfect thing. So I would highly recommend this pattern. It is terribly simple. I'm using uh, US size eight, which is uh, five millimeters. Um, so it, it's also, because it's, um, because I had a fairly light fingering yarn and uh, a larger needle, it's creating a nice open fabric as well. And I'm a bit undecided if I'm gonna keep this or gift it. I'm really in love with it and I want to keep it for myself. Um, but there's also someone I have in mind for it. And I think it'll just depend on once I wash it and block it, if the fiber softens enough that it feels next to, next to skin soft. For me, it does right now, um, but I know not everyone has the same kind of degree of tolerance for uh, more medium fine wools next to skin, like Cory Dale. Uh, so I'm just going to wait to see how it washes and blocks out and then decide. My other work in progress right now is, I mean, technically I haven't cast on yet. It's just a, just a swatch at this point. But uh, I am knitting the Rift Tee by Jacqueline Seaslack. My project bag is a mess as usual. Uh, I'm knitting this. Well, hopefully I'm knitting this. Uh, I'm not quite sure about gauge yet. Um, but I'm knitting this with the Queensland Collection United uh, in their blend of lamb's wool and cotton. It's, uh, it's a sport weight yarn. Uh, and this is in the Celestine colorway. Uh, you get 251 yards for 50 grams, and it was only $8.50 Canadian. And I thought this would be a good option. Um, because it, uh, it's a wool and cotton blend, which is what the original, wh what the pattern was actually written for was a, a wool cotton blend. And this was available to me at my local yarn shop. Um, yeah, the the range doesn't have, they don't have the greatest selection of uh, colors, um, but they do have quite a few nice colors. I'm usually not drawn to pastels, but I am more drawn to them um, in the summer months. And 
I do love blue, so. Yeah, this is what I'm, uh, what I'm using for this project. And I have this swatch. I'm not taking it off the needles because I, I'm probably not gonna keep the swatch. I'm just going to, oh, it's backwards. I'm just gonna rip it out once I'm done. But this is the fabric I'm getting on the recommended needle size, which is the US 8, five millimeter, I believe. Um, and I think because it's a, a fairly light sport weight, um, I'm not quite getting gauge. So I might have to go up a size to get the amount of ease that I want in the pattern. Um, but we'll see, I'll, I will keep you posted. All right, in terms of uh, stash acquisitions and plans, um, I do have just a couple of things to show you. Um, I did purchase um, some more yarn for uh, my next summer garment project, um, which I'm pretty sure will be the Deschen pattern. Um, and I will link that down below. Uh, and the yarn that I purchased for this is the uh, Juniper Moon Farm Zoe. Uh, and this is a 60% cotton, 40% linen blend. And it is a DK weight yarn um, in the color Cell Gris. So, let's see if I can give you a close up there. It's got some really lovely uh, texture to it, and it is very soft. Um, and when I when I look at it up close, it it looks to me like the cotton has been spun as a separate single and the linen has been spun as separate singles and then they're plied together and it, yeah, it looks to me like there's three strands of two ply that have then been plied together. Yeah, so it's kind of um, an interesting construction and it's, it gives it a lot of um, texture. So um, I had to get the gray. I try to venture out as much as I can, but I love gray and I always go back to it. So you'll probably see a lot of gray on this channel. Um, so I'm hoping that will be my, my next garment project um, after the Rift Tea. The only other thing that I had for stash acquisitions and plans, um, I do have, I still have a bit of a Patton's Croy sock yarn stash that I'm working through. Um, and so this was some stash Patton's Croy stash that um, I'm hoping to cast on socks for uh, very soon. And uh, I think that these colors are really fun. The There's grays and pinks and blue and brown and just lots of fun barber pulling. Um, and I think these will be my last pair of gift knit socks for a while and then 
I have big plans to knit myself lots of socks because <laughs> I'm, I'm actually running low on hand knit socks for myself, so I need to get on that. Okay, uh, let's talk spinning. Um, and I can still hear, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can still hear a lawnmower in the distance. Um, and there's nothing I can do about it, so today's quiet corner may not be so quiet, but <laughs> oh well. Uh, what do I have? Okay, let's talk about what I'm most excited about first. Um, I just need to get my spinning journal out. So I've been spinning up um, a Jameson and Smith Shetland top uh, for socks and uh, I finished the skein I think it was last it was earlier this week yeah fairly recently uh, so I will give you a close-up um, I am beyond pleased with this <laughs> I'm just uh, I think it's the most um, effort I've put into a skein so far and that's probably why it's I'm the most pleased with it um, so this is a three ply fingering weight. I got, um, I got 18 wraps per inch. Um, the skein is 108 grams. Uh, so I'm guessing that with the wraps per inch, um, I'm probably around 450 yards, give or take. I don't have a nitty naughty, and I know there are other ways that I could count my yardage, like using a chair or even um, counting the turns on my yarn swift. Uh, but I rarely care to do it, <laughs> so I just... I guesstimate and because I knit my socks toe up it won't matter a whole lot because I can cast off at the cuff whenever I need to uh, but I really don't have any concerns about yardage here I think I have quite enough for a pair of socks um, so I spun this using a short forward draw with a fairly tight drafting triangle. So my drafting triangle was one and a half to two inches at the most throughout. And I found that if I veered away from that triangle, that little triangle, um, immediately my singles became uh, more and more inconsistent. I was aiming for high twist with these because I wanted a lot of durability. Um, and actually, so when this, when I first took the skein off the winder, it was twisting on itself uh, quite significantly. Um, and it still is twisting it, twisting on itself which is what I wanted. Um, so I wasn't going for a, a f completely balanced yarn because I, I want this to be fairly high twist for dur durability purposes. I tend to be hard on my socks um, and I really want these to last. So that's kind of how it's hanging. Little bit of extra twist. Um, and what else can I say about this? I spun the singles on 
10 to 1, which is my highest ratio. That's as high as I can go on my wheel. Um, I'm pretty sure. Don't quote me. But it's definitely my highest or one of my highest ratios. Um, and I'm, I've calculated that I have about five to, had about five to six turns per inch with my singles. And then what I wasn't expecting is that when I plied, which I also plied on 10 to one, when I plied, I also have five to six turns per inch. Um, so the way that I calculated that, and I hope I did this right, was over an inch, I looked at the number of ply twists in that inch. And then because it's a three ply, I divided that number by three. And that is what should be giving me my turns per inch calculation. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows. Um, and so my turns per inch with the plying was also about five to six. So to finish this yarn, I soaked it in warm tap water with a pH balanced uh, wash. And then I snapped it about 10 times. I don't tend to thwack. I tend to just snap my skeins. And then I hung it to dry with weight at the bottom for a couple of days. Um, and I'm super, super pleased with it. It's, um, I would say definitely my most consistent spin yet. Uh, I am a bit concerned that it's a little, uh, a little too much on the fine side for what I usually like. I like um, more of a sport weight for my socks. Uh, but luckily I, I did go ahead and purchase these uh, smaller Chiagu needles, which are a size zero. Don't know if it says in here. Size zero, two millimeter circular needles. And so I'm hoping that these will help to give me quite a tight fabric um, to just improve the durability of the socks. Um, yeah, so I guess it's my latest spinning FO and I can hardly wait to cast on socks. Uh, I'm hoping to do something with uh, some really kind of simple texture uh, for these socks. Something like um, something like Hermione's everyday sock um, or uh, one of one of my viewers, Tracy Kuzniak, I think. I think that's your last name. Sorry, Tracy, if I've got it wrong. Uh, but she also mentioned, uh, what was it? The simple skip sock. The simple skip sock. And I had a look at that pattern too, and I really like it. Um, so if I can, it, it all depends because I'm, it's 18 wraps per inch, it's fairly fine, and I'll be knitting on a smaller needle size than most sock patterns call for. So I'll just have to see if I can adjust to get gauge for a sock pattern. Um, and if not, I might just use my own recipe but add in the elements of the, the sock pattern, either the skip sock or Hermione's everyday sock or if something else comes up that catches my eye. Um, so it'll be a bit of an experiment. Um, 
so that's that FO. Uh, and I will also note the interesting thing is in my journal here, I don't have a sample of the finished yarn here yet, uh, but you can see just how different my finished yarn, you could probably see. This is the plyback that I was using as a, as a gauge originally, but this is what I ended up with. I don't know if you can see like just how much, I'll try to pull out a few, a strand here. So there's a strand and there's my plyback and you can see how much finer my finished yarn turned out to be. And I think that's because when I did the original, the first plyback, I, it was more balanced in the ply twist. And when I got around to actually plying, I realized that I needed a lot more ply twist for this to be a strong yarn. And so that's what kind of tightened up, um, tightened up all those uh, singles into a much finer, but denser um, yarn. Um, so I'm really excited to keep you posted on this project. Um, and something I would love to do eventually is some videos that go more into depth on a specific project because I feel like I could talk about sock spinning for socks and knitting for sock spinning and knitting socks um, for ages. It's like one of those topics that I just I don't know I could talk in more depth about. So if you'd be interested down the road, um, I might be. I might make some more kind of focused videos. It'll also all depend on how durable the finished product ends up being. If they turn out, then I'll probably share a more detailed video with you about um, how I spun them and how I knit them. Um, I do have another spinning project on the wheel. Um, so I'm aiming for a DK weight two ply. Those are my singles and these are my, this is my ply back test. Um, and I'm spinning them from these roll eggs that I created with, um, my blending board using Ashford Corydale and a mystery, well, it's a merino fiber, um, but I, I don't know where it's from anymore. Um, and I just thought I'd share a little tip. If you have a blending board, um, because I, I do find that the blending board tends to compact the fibers quite a bit and it makes it hard to spin from these, like straight from the roll egg. Um, so I'll show you what I do, what works for me really well, is to actually pre-draft the entire roll egg or half. So I'll break this in half. And then I just um, pre-draft the whole roll egg or piece of the roll egg like this. And anywhere that I kind of come across some fibers that are perhaps more compacted than others, I just work on attenuating that a little bit more. And I go down the whole length of the um, roll egg until it's 
all pre-drafted. And then I just kind of create these loops of the fiber. And I actually use uh, a door handle, um, a doorknob that's beside my spinning wheel <laughs> um, in my spinning corner to hold the, the roll egg like this. And then I can just kind of spin off of it. Um, and unravel it as I need to. Um, and as you can see, once you do that, the fibers are quite open and airy and they, they draft um, much more easily in my experience than drafting straight from the roll egg. Um, and that I have found has really helped me to get a more consistent singles um, is if I do this pre-drafting than if I try to spin straight from the roll egg. So that is the only spinning project that I have on the wheel right now. The only other thing for this segment that I wanted to show you was a little natural dyeing experiment that I did recently. So this is the same fiber as this um, this Shetland. So this was the Fawn Shetland top. Um, I had originally purchased 200 grams so this is what was left over from my sock spin. Um, and I just thought it would be fun to do another dyeing experiment. So I dyed this. I'm just gonna try to find a good sample for you. It's a lovely um, kind of deep, deeper shade of blue um, with maybe a, it's got a hint of kind of teal to it as well. Um, but this, I, I dyed up with black turtle beans, which is, not at all a color fast dye, um, natural dye. So it will fade um, with washing and it will also fade with light, the sun. The light will, will fade the color. Um, but that's, it's totally fine with me. I, I really, I did it for fun uh, just to see. I'm also curious to see, you know, how long the color will last. It's already been washed a couple of times and rinsed multiple times. Um, and the colors held up okay. So I'll link down below the, there were a few different resources that I uh, looked at to figure out how to dye this wool um, with the black turtle beans. Um, and this time around, I did use a hot process. And my last dyeing experiment was cold process and I didn't enjoy it so much. Or not that I didn't enjoy it, I guess I just, um, I was a bit disappointed that the color didn't stick as well as I had hoped it would. It wasn't as vibrant. I was still happy with it, but yeah. I wanted to try the hot process and it seemed to work well for the black turtle beans. Um, I do think, and I've heard about this happening for other natural dyers, um, that the texture of the yarn can really change after dyeing to begin with. 
but then also with natural dye um, because the the actual plant materials from your dye um, can they're sticking to the wool and they're changing the texture of it and it's crazy the difference in texture after dyeing this compared to the original top and I think the original top um, was probably you know it may have been steamed so that all of the fibers were um, much more smooth um, because now after uh, after being in some heat again and then drying um, all of the crimp factor like the natural crimp in the wool has come back um, so I thought that was interesting and I actually think that I might enjoy spinning it more now um, than when it was more kind of slippery uh, but the one thing I will say is um, I think I may have slightly overheated the fiber um, because it's almost it's not felted but it feels like it's been almost fold in a way um, and I, I think I will have to do some of this pre-drafting work um, to open the fibers again before I spin with them um, but yeah I think that looks quite lovely and like it will will be lovely to spin up um, so I'm thinking that I will that eventually this might be another pair of socks um, I also have some more Ashford Corydale that I would like to try spinning for socks um, because it is in a um, combed top preparation um, where the fibers are aligned so, and I, I have heard that Corey Dale makes a good sock yarn, so I might try that first. We'll see. Um, I could also blend the Corey Dale and the Shetland. Um, I've heard that the two blend well together, so that's something I could try as well. Um, the only other thing to mention for spinning is that I actually purchased my first fleece. I'm so excited for it to arrive um, sometime in June likely. Um, and I took Sarah Bone's recommendation. Um, Sarah is the host of the Crafting with Compassion podcast and she has so much experience with working with fleece and she purchases her fleece from Nystock Farms. But I have reserved a fleece from Nystock Farms. Um, I've already been in, in touch with uh, Robin, the shepherdess, and I've reserved um, the fleece, a half fleece, from a sheep uh, named Chemise. Yeah, I'm, I'm just beyond excited to process my first fleece. Um, my parents also um, lovingly gifted me a pair or a set of, um, it's a wool comb and hackle set. And uh, that is also, um, I ordered it from the woolery uh, but it's on back order, I believe, because it has to come all the way from Denmark. It's, I think they're made in Denmark. They have to go to the woolery in the States and then be shipped up to me in Canada. So the wait is like six to eight weeks. Um, but 
I'm really looking forward to having um, that tool for processing fleece over the summer um, and I'll certainly update you on how that goes because the staple length for chemises fleece is about four and a half inches on average it should be long enough to comb um, and I decided to go with wool combs as my first you know um, fiber prep tools um, because I think that I am primarily a worsted style spinner. Uh, I, I really appreciate woolen yarns and I'm trying to kind of grow my experience in that area. Um, but uh, I do love a worsted prep, so and, and a worsted yarn. I just, I really love the, um, I love seeing ply twist definition. I think that's really what does it for me. <laughs> yeah, so those are some exciting things ahead. So I think that's it for me in terms of knitting and spinning. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, um, it, it's felt like it's felt like a heavy week and harder to just kind of talk about knitting. Um, it feels like such a luxury. Um, I've just been reflecting and thinking a lot about. Uh, George Floyd and all those before him um, and essentially just it's been a week of acknowledging the fact that I'm not satisfied with the degree of self-reflection and personal anti-racism work that I've done not that I ever will or should be satisfied think you know I should be learning and reflecting constantly um, over my lifetime um, but yeah so I I've committed to really diving into some resources on uh, anti-racism and self-reflection for my own uh, growth in that area and I feel like it's important to say as the host of this space as well because I I want to do the hard work that I need to do to make sure that this is a safe space for everyone um, so I thought I would just uh, share some of the resources that I found down below if anyone else uh, is looking for um, reading material and learning opportunities. Yeah, I think that's what I would like to share. In terms of kind of the summer ahead, um, Dan and I are excited to do a bit of planning this weekend, um, hopefully, uh, book some, some camping trips in, though the provincial parks here haven't officially opened yet, and so there's a good chance that we'll get to the time of our reserved camping trip and it will be cancelled. Um, but I really, fingers crossed, um, that maybe if we book something later in the summer that, you know, single family units will at least be able to camp in Ontario, um, while still respecting physical distancing measures, um, 
because I'm really itching to get out there in the wild um, and do some backcountry camping. I hope that you are all um, finding ways to adventure and enjoy uh, nature uh, and all of its gifts uh, during this time. So anyway, friends, um, I'm wishing you a very makeful month until I see you again. Bye for now. Thank you.